Um, so, and now uh, it is my great honor to introduce Luigi Ferrucci, Professor Luigi Ferrucci. Uh, if you don't know who that is, please Google and look at the scholar profile. Um, I, I think it's the only, well, there are very, very few people in the world where this kind of H index is 205, uh, 240,000 citations. Uh, and some papers are, uh, you know, over 20,000 uh, citations. So it's uh, in our field, it's incredible. Uh, Dr. Ferrucci works for the government. So he works for the uh, NIH, National Institute of Aging. Uh, he's a geriatrician and epidemiologist uh, and also heads the Baltimore Longitudinal Study, which we all use. Um, so Dr. Luigi Ferrucci, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And you know, the, the, it's a high, high bar, you know, before, you know, talking about uh, these two initial presentation, I think that, uh, you know, you're asking for a lot. Let me see if I can start by sharing my slide. Can you see my slides now? Yes, perfectly. I just uh, put it in the presentation mode and... Yes, I'm trying. Okay. Perfect. Can you see that? Wow. Perfect. Beautiful. Yes. So, so um, uh, I think that uh, this uh, meeting has been absolutely terrific. And, and uh, you know, there are many, many details that I will have to ponder, you know, over the days to come. But one thing that seems to be really true is that uh, the mechanisms of aging are hiding behind uh, the curtain of extreme complexity. So when I say mitochondrial dysfunction drives aging, uh, of course, I'm going to give you a mitochondrial-centric view, which is I love mitochondria. Those little organelles to me are almost magic. But uh, I know and I'm very aware that, uh, you know, they work and interact with uh, many, many other mechanisms uh, and sorts of, uh, you know, uh, the regulation in the cell during the aging process. I want to start by something technical. I only work in humans. I don't do any studies uh, in animal model or in uh, self line. And so studying mitochondria in humans uh, is a little bit complex, but, but we're lucky because uh, energy by mitochondria in humans, uh, especially in the muscle, is uh, handled by the muscle cell in a very specific way. It's handled by accumulating energy into phosphocreatinine and then using the phosphocreatinine and then the phosphocreatinine get, uh, you know, uh, recharged by mitochondria. And because MRI can uh, visualize and quantify the in vivo uh, phosphocreatinine and inorganic phosphorus, we can make, uh, you know, our participant exercise the magnet that you can see here and then when they exercise their phosphocreatinine decline, and then we make them stop. And then when they make them stop, we know that at rest, most of the metabolism is aerobic. And so that we see this recovery rate and by mathematically estimating the constant of this recovery rate, we can measure mitochondrial function. Okay, and we have done this in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging longitudinally in thousands of individuals. I'll show you just cross-sectional data. The longitudinal data look a little bit steeper than the cross-sectional data, but you can see that both in men and in women with large variability across individuals, there is a substantial decline of mitochondrial function. Is then mitochondrial function and energy availability important for aging? I wanna try to demonstrate to you and uh, both in the theoretical terms, but also showing you some data that is absolutely fundamental. So first of all, let me start by saying that for me, aging is, uh, the aging rate can be estimated by the ratio between two parameters. You know, very simplistic, the speed of damage accumulation and our repair capacity. If you can estimate these two parameters, then what you get is the speed of biological aging. So there are many ways that repair capacity can occur. So you may have macromolecular damage, for example, misfolded or damaged protein, oxidated lipid or DNA damage. There are two ways that our 
you know, cells uh, deal with those damages. The first one is uh, they repair those damage and there are specific mechanisms for repair those damage. You know, chaperone protein can refold the protein that has been misfolded. The, the antioxidant that protect our DNA. There is incredibly complex and efficient mechanism of DNA repair. But when the damage is above a certain level, you can't really repair them. And so the decision is to cycle and replace. And so, for example, you know, Anna Maria was talking about microautophagy. There is the ubiquitin proteasome system in general, catabolism. And then when you have eliminated one protein, you have to substitute this. So you have to synthesize and produce another protein. We can make similar consideration when we talk about organelles. You know, you have uh, mitochondrial damage. Uh, to a certain extent, you can repair mitochondrial damage, but or above a certain level of damage, uh, you have to decide to recycle and replace. So you recycle the mitochondria so that you create space and capacity to do mitochondrial biogenesy and uh, create a new one. The point I want to make here is that all those things are good. All of these oppose aging. And, and at the tissue level, I'm not going to go into the detail, but the analysis of consideration can be made. All these require energy. So when you are going to repair capacity, energy is a limiting factor. And so if you have a decline in energy because of mitochondrial dysfunction, then your repair capacity is reduced. And that will lead to damage accumulation that translate phenotypically and functionally into aging. And I'm giving you just you know, a couple of examples here. You know, insulin resistance, endothelial dysfunction, altered signaling, we, and inflammation, there are many, many, many others that I can give you. So what's happened to these mitochondria? Why these mitochondria? change to decline in the function with aging. So the first of all, an important consideration here is to say what happened to the cell? You know, the cell has less energy, has many, many things that the cell want to do, but not all of them can be done because of this lack of energy. And so it needs to make decisions. And so the main sensor to understand that there is not enough energy is IMP kinase, which read the really the ratio between AMP and ATP, and then regulate uh, a number of mechanisms. I could have come with a slide that would require an hour to explain here, but I, I wanted to simplify. So we really try to do energy rescue by doing mitochondrial bi biogenesis, and you try to eliminate uh, all the um, sorts of energy consumption that at least uh, temporarily can be stopped. And so you, you can have cycle, cycle arrest, you reduce uh, um, cholesterol synthesis, uh, uh, you, 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 you reduce uh, protein synthesis by regulation of mTOR. And of course, anytime you do this, uh, it's a difficult choice to make because uh, if you reduce protein synthesis, that means that you need to keep your protein for longer time. And when you keep those proteins for longer time and you can recycle them, then the damage accumulation is going to stay longer and longer. And in the long term, it's going to have functional effect. So what are the hypothesis about the potential cause of, uh, of, of, of mitochondrial dysfunction? Uh, well, we have to go back to you know, some result of the epidemiology. So if you look at... Uh, mitochondrial function that we study with the P31 spectroscopy. And then you look in the plasma of the same individual to find what are the metabolites that seem to be associated with lower mitochondrial dysfunction. The first thing you see that are mostly lipids. You know, seem to be a metabolism in lipids. And uh, what you find is that the lysophosphatidylcholines, uh, especially the 18.1, and the 18.2 are those that seem dysregulated and independent of compounds that are associated with mitochondrial function. 
Now, these lysophosphatidylcholine are really important because they are the main uh, bricks for the synthesis of cardiolipin. And you know that cardiolipin is a phenomenal important lipid that is only exists in mitochondria and is fundamental to the maintenance of the architecture of the crest. And without this architecture, the electrotransposition chain cannot function. But by chance, we found that uh, when you look at the, the metabolized, the strongly, the most strongly predict uh, both cross-sectionally and longitudinally walking speed with a very, very strong biomarker of AG, you find that lysophosphatidine choline 18-2 is the strongest association, the most significant of any other. Make you suspect that they, in fact, the synthesis of cardiolipin is creating mitochondrial dysfunction. And this mitochondrial dysfunction has important functional consequence in the individual. Now, how lipids are important? Um, you know, there, are, there is a beautiful paper by Rattray et al. that show that uh, when you look at frailty in large population, and you look at metabolomics of frailty, what you find is that vitamin E is strongly antioxidant and the carnitine shuttle energy mechanisms are associated with frailty. So again, uh, in mitochondrial complex, uh, lipids, uh, cardiolipin, and uh, a transported of the lipid uh, between the different, the, the wall of the, the internal uh, membrane of, of the mitochondria. But, but if you, if we want to look at what are also other mechanisms that you look in humans, uh, in reality, we found that 30% of the decline of mitochondrial function is due to a decline in perfusion in older compared to younger individuals. And the decline of perfusion is detectable at rest and independent of other compounds also associated with mitochondrial function. So we have a metabolic component, but also a vascular component. And this is important because you can actually study the vascular component that is related to the substrate uh, um, you know, delivery only by looking at, uh, you know, uh, live individual, only in vivo, this can be studied. We did a study of mitochondrial function associated with walking speed that uh, really to confirm the hypothesis of this association. And we found that uh, KPCR, which is the constant of creatinine recovery was strongly associated with walking speed and was also strongly associated with muscle strength. And then when we did a mediation analysis, we found that in fact, a large part between 20 and 30% of this association was explained by the effect of mitochondrial function on muscle. But, you know, somebody mentioned when I was giving this presentation that maybe this is limited to muscle because muscle are so energetically demanding that uh, the function of mitochondria becomes so important. And in fact, it is not true. Here, for example, we did a study in collaboration with Anna Maria looking at uh, you know, the CD, uh, uh, lymphocyte, CD4 lymphocytes uh, uh, in older and younger individuals for the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. And to make a very long story short, we found that uh, the number of mitochondria between older and younger cells were not different, but most of the mitochondria in older cells were englobated uh, by autophagic vacuoles, and uh, that uh, suggesting that uh, there was a defective autophagy that was not recycling properly this mitochondria, and probably this mitochondria were unable to produce energy. And this is confirmed, uh, you know, when you look at LC3 staining. Uh, you know, in, in, in men 25 years old or in men 87 years old, it's very, very clear that there's an overexpression of LC3 in the older. Now, I wanna tell you that uh, we were working on this assumption that the recovery is absolutely important. And the reason why, is because the recovery is not affected by many things, it's metabolically silent. We know that it's all aerobic. 
But when we try to correlate uh, this uh, KPCR constant with some of the important value parameters of aging, such as, for example, feeling fatigues, we couldn't find a strong association. And a very smart postdoc pointed out that, in fact, uh, the recovery seems to be OK for everybody. But during the exercise, uh, the older individual tend to do much, much worse and become fatigued immediately. So the depletion of the phosphatidylatinine occur in the matter of seconds. So that uh, the slope of this curve, uh, that is the rate of depletion of the phosphocreatinine seems to be important. And when we did that, uh, these are preliminary data where we're expanding this analysis, all the data we have collected so far, we found that in fact, uh, the rate of PCR drop was uh, different between younger and older individual. And also there was a strong correlation between uh, the rate of PCR depletion in the Borg scale, that is the perception of effort that people were making during exercise. Okay, I'm gonna do fast. So to more, better understand mechanism, we try to do proteomics in skeletal muscle. We did biopsy, we've done now 100, but this analysis was on 60. And we found that of course, uh, protein that are mitochondrial protein are strongly downregulated with aging. Now, we also found something that we were not expecting. So in the muscle, the splicing protein were absolutely. So the splicing machinery is generated, there is incredible variability of protein that characterize human biology, especially in the brain and in the muscle. And the opposite, when we reanalyze the data and we look at exercise, instead of looking at aging, we found that there was opposite. There was massive, you know, upregulation of uh, mitochondrial protein, but there was a real downregulation of the splicing machine. So it's an opposite the direction that we see ongoing. And so in order to study this better, we leverage on the fact that we had the proteomic data in the muscle on the same individual where we had the P31 spectroscopy. So the P, same piece of muscle could be studied through the two characteristics. Again, this is a study done by Delia Fatime, and, and she found that there was a number of proteins associated with better mitochondrial function. As you can imagine, mitochondrial translation in my, in, in protein of the respiratory electrotransport uh, was strongly correlated with better mitochondrial function. But the third pathway that we found uh, was the MRA splicing. Now, I don't have the time to go into the detail, but we have many, many more proof later on that uh, when mitochondria are non-functioning, when there is a scarcity of energy, even within the, net, the limit of normal, not in frail individuals, there are mechanisms that, that increase uh, and enhance the splicing machine. So some of the compensatory strategies that we have not studied, again, it's probably related to differential splicing. And, and I will almost say that, you know, we'll discover in the future that the differential splicing is one of the hallmarks of aging. So, uh, I'm going to conclude with a few highlights. Mitochondrial function declines with age in human, and the curtailed energy availability accelerated the biological damage because you can't really have compensation without energy. Mechanisms of biological resilience are healthy, organized, have repair and recycle, replace, but both of them require extra energy availability. And the decline of mitochondrial function with age is partially explained by reduced perfusion that is many healthy individual, alter the carnitine and cardiolipine biosynthetic pathways, and pair carnitine shuttle. And, and that, uh, I think that area that needs to be studied more. And, you know, I think that one of the previous speakers talked about, you know, urylating A and the, the stimulate uh, mitophagy. And I think that, that that would be an important therapeutic target to study both the observation and longitudinal study in the future. So my conclusion is mechanical compensation to reduce energy may rely on alternative splicing. And, and I hope that uh, 
you know, in the next version of this really fantastic meeting, I can show you some data that confirm this hypothesis. Thank you for your uh, listening to my presentation. And of course, uh, you know, you need uh, the city to do this. And so this is a really incredible group that I'm leading with Rafael de Cabo and that um, is doing most of this work. Thank you very much, Luigi, for such a brilliant presentation. Uh, we have, for, for, for everybody on the call, we have a 40 minute break. So now it's 30 minutes. Uh, so we have some time for questions, uh, but if you, uh, if you want to leave uh, for, for, for some time, please do so, um, just on a side note. Uh, and um, uh, lots of questions. Uh, let's start with a question from Morton, uh, which is most upvoted. Uh, so fantastic talk, Luigi. If energy restrict, uh, restriction with age is resulting in aging pathologies, why is sugar consumption bad for you when you get old? Good consumption has uh, not very much to do with mitochondrial function. You know, in fact, uh, we show that when you try to load, you know, fuel into the mitochondria and uh, put more substrate, uh, the mitochondria are unable to handle that fuel that accumulate around the mitochondria and create mitochondrial dysfunction. What we need to do is to improve the intrinsic capacity of the mitochondria to use uh, that substrate uh, and transport through oxidative phosphorylation into chemical energy. And I think that, uh, you know, that's why calorie restriction actually improves mitochondrial function. It doesn't really decline it. And actually the follow-up question from Morton. Um, uh, so does glycogen storage change with age? Glycogen storage, uh, um, I don't know, actually. That's a great question and a question that uh, we could actually test in our center. I will predict that glycogen storage um, would be reduced with aging. That would be, that would be my guess, but I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that uh, the problem is that uh, when we talk about aging in human, we are putting together you know, aging process and the changing body composition of a society where all us are overnourished. So, so that, that, that we have to deal with these two phenomena and I don't know when they interact, what can generate. I'm sure this study, this has been studied, but I don't know the answer. Uh, thank you for this answer. So a uh, question from uh, uh, Michael Anson. Uh, we have now, um, we have known uh, uh, from, 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 from several studies that uh, uh, restricting energy intake or possibly uh, periodic fasting slows the morphological changes in muscle and mitochondrial morphology in, mu uh, in muscle. How does this interface with your diet data? So we don't have data that directly look at that. We will. I mean, I think that uh, we are planning to study um, in, in, in both a model of a ketonic uh, increase in the diet and calorie restriction with the P31 spectroscopy. And I will be able to tell you, you know, what is the system. But, but you know, I think that uh, what Anna Maria was uh, showing clearly is that, uh, you know, you are increasing autophagy. And, uh, you know, if, if you are stimulate autophagy and you have a dysfunctional mitochondria, it's much more likely that that mitochondria will be eliminated. And then uh, through mitochondrial biogenesis, you will be able to create new mitochondria that are functional. To me, the problem is that we see dysphoric mitochondria. We see mitochondria that are englobated in uh, um, this uh, bacro. And, and, and we see, for example, in older age, uh, pieces of mitochondria that are in uh, exosomic vesicles. And, and why should they be there when there is a beautiful mechanism that should eliminate them? And to me, that is where we need to really understand why this recycling of the mitochondria is not working. And so, you know, the, the, the mitochondria that remain there stimulate inflammation through different mechanisms. We just published a paper showing that in human, 
reduction of mitochondrial function is associated with higher level of inflammation. And so I, I think that, uh, as I was mentioning at the beginning, we're dealing with a complex, uh, how aging is a very complex system, which is really good because we can have fun for a long time and we also will have a job for a long time. Thank you for such a comprehensive answer. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Uh, a question from uh, somebody you know well, who worked at the NIH together with uh, Morton, uh, so Evandro Feifang. Uh, nice uh, talk, Dr. Ferrucci, long time no see. Uh, mitophagy plays a fundamental role in mitochondrial homeostasis, homeostasis um, via eliminating damaged mitochondria. My question is, uh, have you ever checked changes in mitophagy in the muscle tissues you acquired? And if yes, any age-dependent reduction in mitophagy? I mean, that, that, that is a beautiful question and, uh, you know, a question I always get. What we need to realize is that when you study humans, uh, there's many things that you cannot do as when you study animal models. But the beauty is the integration between the two. So is to study a mechanism in animal model and cell model, and then see whether at least the major assumption are true. What I can tell you, for example, is that uh, I didn't really have the time to show this data, but we've done three-dimensional microscopy in muscle or individual different age. And you saw that the mitochondria in muscle are not those uh, kidney-shaped uh, organelles that we see in the books that we studied when we were you know, in high school. Those are a very complex interconnected network. And the interconnected network change continuously in terms of communication. The number of communication is substantially reduced in, in, in older individual compared to younger individual. And, and that is supposed to be in order to facilitate autophagy. And, and, and uh, I, I think that, that uh, you know, as we study it, uh, those dynamic changes will have to be understood better in, in, in connection you know, with the what Anna Maria was saying, you know, with, with the, the, the autophagy pathway and see whether they're regulated by that. But what we know is that without those connections, the mitochondria don't function well enough. Because uh, in the muscle cell at the periphery, you receive enough substrate. In the center, it's not enough time for the substrate to permeate the, part, the central part of the fiber. So what travel within the fiber is electric, uh, um, you know, the, the differential or potential, you know, within those connections. So when you start interrupting those connections, certainly there's something that doesn't work. Now, I would love to see whether by using something like urolithin A, you know, in individual where you see improvement in muscle mass, so you also see increase in the connection of mitochondria. And so that, that I think is a study that we need to do in the future. Thank you. Um, and I hope that you'll be able to see each other uh, soon with Evandro. Um, so a new, next question is from uh, Thomas Seal uh, from Kinexum. Uh, what are the best uh, candidate therapeutic interventions that preserve or enhance uh, mitochondrial function with aging? I think that we shouldn't forget the exercise. I mean, I, 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 when Thomas Rando was talking and said that exercise is the best anti-aging, and we see this clearly. I mean, I show you very, very briefly our proteomic data. But what we see that of the upregulated protein with the exercise, and here I'm talking about exercise is a normal population, is between being sedentary and walking 20 minutes per day. You see 75% of the mitochondria protein upregulated, clearly, substantially, with full change above two. So exercise is really, you know, the bar. We need to get there, and we're not there with any intervention. Of the different intervention that I've seen, I think that, uh, you know, I think that uh, the dietary uh, restriction, especially the time restricted feeding, has a very, very strong potential. I think that, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, the same masculine is all A. If we potentiate mitophagy, we give to the body 
some way of eliminating those dysfunctional mitochondria. And then I would love to try urinating A. I think that you know the data that are coming out are really promising. So I, I, you know this is a hook for the company to contact us so we can start working together. Uh, thank you for this uh, generous answer. Uh, question from David Garcia. Uh, how do you differentiate the dysfunction of the mitochondria that occurs with age uh, and is always detrimental versus the reduced production of ATP and protein synthesis uh, result of caloric restriction that has uh, a beneficial effect? So, so uh, it's, that, that's a very, very complex question. I think that the, the, mito, the dysfunction of the mitochondria that occur with aging is associated with morphological changes and associated also with the disequilibrium between the different protein component of the electrotransportation change. One thing that I didn't tell you, for example, is with aging, we see that the TCA protein and the the Krebs cycle proteins uh, the, and, and the electrotransportation chain proteins are, are dramatically reduced. But if you look at the protein that of the external membrane of the mitochondria, they really don't change. So you have fragments of the mitochondria that are still there. So you see that there is fragmentation and morphological change. And that's why at some point we decided that looking at the mitochondria in um, electron microscopy, you know, in 3D or in 2D was absolutely fundamental. In reality, when you look at the mitochondria in color restriction studies and only seen study in animal model, but, but uh, we should start looking at that also in humans, uh, the mitochondria are pristine, you know, are beautiful, are really well conserved. So they are walking at their functioning as low level. We preserve their function very well because you're not really pushing them be beyond the limit. And so I think that the difference between these two stays into low rate of mitochondrial production because you are regulating them to be you know, producing less. So you have a machine that potentially can go much higher but you're using only for 30%. And a machine that can only do that 30%, and 30% is the best that the kind of machine can do. So stimulation and stimulus will be really, you know, measure of resilience will be the way to discriminate between these two. Thank you. And last question, but not least, there are many, many, as you can imagine. Uh, Rachel uh, Schwartz. Um, do you see any value of carnitine supplementation for improving mitochondrial function and aging? Well, I think there is a long, a strong potential. You know, I've been trying to, uh, well, there is a, you know, the story that the Italian won the soccer game, you know, championship because they were taking carnitine and maybe true or not true. But I think there is a lot of evidence out there then the, the shuttle of lipid for beta oxidation within the mitochondria is truly a limiting factor. And that every time you can really use the lipid oxidation, you have to rely on carbohydrate metabolism. And that has a lot of really negative implication for the cell. So I think that there is a lot of potential. And there's not been a really good design and well-powered study to show whether carnitine works or not. Yes, I think a lot of people are taking it. That is basically probably by the time we're finished talking, somebody, well, the world is going to consume a ton. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, can you share by any chance, uh, are, are you taking any of those supplements yourself or not? I am not taking any supplement, but um, I try to run 100 miles per month. That is my medicine, you know. 25 miles per week, that is uh, my medicine. I think that, uh, you know, you increase autophagy, you potentiate the mitochondria, and I also eat very healthy. I think that, uh, you know, cooking is my hobby, but I love to cook with healthy food. Uh, thank you for this uh, answer. Um, 
it would be nice to, to hear from somebody who run, runs the you know, Baltimore uh, longitudinal study to uh, to comment on their own personal regimen to see, you know, maybe <laughs> carnitine or something like that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's great to see you. Let's uh, give 15 minutes uh, uh, to the audience uh, for, for Thank you very break. much and congratulations for the really fantastic meeting and all the speakers did a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, it's amazing, and thank you.